please uh, let's begin. So I think we've been talking about the clinical picture, some of the clinical aspects of uh, viruses. And uh, you must have felt that uh, there's a lot of information there. And as I take you through uh, some of the aspects of virology, I want you to keep in mind the theme. And you'll see me repeating over and over again. And uh, if I may get, well, I'll just have trouble with that. That's fine. So many a times the impact pictures stand as an important concept for you to register in your mind that viruses cause tissue injury. Viruses cause tissue injury and some of the tissue injuries are very obvious, very common and rampant. They are there, I'm pretty sure most of the viruses I'm going to talk about, most of them, you may have had those virus infections. Very common cold sore, right? You see many people have the cold sore. It's a typical uh, term that people use. There are quite a few over-the-counter drugs available. But uh, in this class, we'll discuss what is the virus associated with. So this basically clinical term for this particular gene is called herpes labialis. So herpes. And again, keep in mind, in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about herpes, which is a DNA, DNA virus. And uh, you should be able to judge which herpes is dangerous or infective and how much attention should you give to that particular her herpes. So again, same theme as we had for all microbiology, structure, physiology of virus, epidemiology, clinical picture, diagnosis, prevention and treatment, pretty much the same. Now, we agree that we normally see that. Most of us may have had that. If I was to do statistics, which I don't want to do, I didn't take Kumar's class. So uh, <laughs> everyone, I would say 100% of the populations may have had that once in their life. So this basically is a DNA virus. I'm going to talk two important, closely related, closely related DNA viruses. Herpes simplex virus, HSV. And that should ring a bell in your mind because we have that as an STD as well. Okay, so just try to connect darts in your mind, something that was there on your lips, very common, and then again, uh, an STD as well. So that's where you need to figure out and learn today. The other important thing is varicella zoster virus. You wonder uh, what type of questions can be asked. For example, I'll just give you an example of uh, Select the correct statement because I thought you guys are more into correct statement than incorrect statement. But uh, this is what complexities come when you ask a person to pick up one correct answer. And this is based upon the structure of a virus. So if I bring this question, I'm not going to have, have five distractors from the same virus. I'm going to bring four distractors from the other viruses. So you have to know what's happening with the other viruses in this case. The other important thing is that what are the important DNA viruses? We talked about some of the DNA viruses yesterday, papilloma, adenoma, polioma. So these are some of the viruses. Today we'll talk about the herpes and pox. And then I will talk about HEPA DNA virus in the upcoming lectures. Now, <clears throat> some of the features are unique with herpes virus as a family. So they represent a family of virus. And uh, you can see, if you remember, they are DNA virus. They have a double-stranded DNA genome. And again, they, they come uh, with proteins. So there are proteins outside this virus, like a capsid. So they are kind of enclosed there. And these proteins, of course, uh, manipulate your immune system, and you have an immune response. And uh, also remember that 
as a rule, viruses come and they bring along their polymerase. I gave you an example for the zipper. You put things together. So you have this polymerase, DNA polymerase, that causes uh, replication of that particular DNA virus. And then again, they are good targets for the antiviral therapy. The other important thing for these group of viruses is the DNA replication and the capsid assembly occurs in the nucleus. You have to go back to the, one of the slides where I said that some of this assembly takes place in cytoplasm, but some of the uh, assembly may take place in nucleus. And then once virus is formed, it buds out. I use the layman term bud out, but the technical scientific term is exocytosis. And when they exocytose, they may lyse the cell. And another important thing that I want you to keep in mind, in tissue injury caused by viruses is a injury we call cell-cell bridges. So what happened is that like your chairs, they've been bridged together. I cannot take one chair out, that they are bridged together. So a virus is within the cell. It's not gonna come out of the cell, be released in liquid form, and then infect another tissue. It will just laterally penetrate the cell next to it. So it keep on going laterally. So the ligand starts small, it spreads out. So that's a concept you have to have. Herpes virus are ubiqu ubiquitous, uh, present everywhere. You have to have a very strong cell-mediated immunity. Right? If I tell you that what do you expect the incidence of uh, herpes virus infection in HIV? What do you guess? What kind of incidence are we expecting? Very high. Very high, right? And if you are giving a drugs like in transplant patients, if a person is suffering from a cancer, what are the chances of him having herpes virus infection? Very high. So you can make things together in terms of immunodeficiencies that you may get, especially for cell-mediated immunity compromise. Uh, we talked about uh, the enzymes and uh, the proteins that are encoded. And um, yesterday we talked about uh, oncogenic, oncogenic viruses, but you can see uh, herpes virus 8. There are a lot of different types of it. And Epstein-Barr viruses are two notorious viruses that are associated with human cancers. And we talked about human papilloma yesterday as well. If you were to look at herpes simplex virus under an electron micrograph, and you can see from here, they look like circular, very, very well organized structures. So you'll see the DNA inside and then a very important protein layer across that. And I'm going to present to you another slide and you, that should ring a bell in you because I did talk about that appearance, a fried egg appearance. And if you don't remember, I talked about a mycoplasma. But if this virus was to be seen, it has a fried egg appearance as well. So you can see the central structure and, and the peripheral uh, envelope. If you want to look at the structural element of this particular bacteria, again, you will see a DNA there, a DNA core. And then there is a special thing I said, like a capsule, which, is, which has a structure. So it has either eight ends or eight corners or 12 corners or 24 corners. It's like more of a crystal kind of a thing. And then outer coat is a glycoprotein. Does anybody remember what did I say yesterday? Where would these glycoproteins come from? How would a virus get these particular glycoproteins which have those spikes? From the cell membrane of the host. So once they bud out, they pick up the cell membrane. That's why they sometimes fool your immune system and will present to you as if they are yourself. Some of the pictures it, you can see on the top, A, which basically shows that uh, virus is budding out. So virus buds out from there. So it kind of assembles and then releases out like tiny dots. And then again, another picture over here from your book, you see a DNA core inside. And if you were to look at the capsid structure, so you will see a structure that has those kind of spikes all over. So those spikes all over, and these are glycoprotein. I gave you an example yesterday 
glycoprotein is something that you stick onto like a postage stamp. Okay? So this is how, if you were to look under microscope, electron micrograph, the viruses look like. Uh, what are the disease mechanisms for herpes simplex viruses? Remember so far, I'm just talking about the whole family, and then I'm going to go in detail. It may occur to you right now that they share some of the common characteristics. Now, the important thing you have to keep in mind that this particular virus that like your cold sore you have on the lip uh, can be infective. So it can be spread by oral genital contact. And then again, once it goes into the, your system, herpes virus can reach brain as well. So these are, any virus that can reach your brain is going to be scary. What kind of tissue injury these viruses cause? And I gave you the impact slide. You saw that kind of a region, which is quite painful. And I said, this is a tissue injury. If you want to know the actual pathogenesis for that, it is called cytopathology cytopathological effect, meaning that viruses enter the cell to replicate. In the process of them doing it, they destroy the cell. This is called cytopathology. Depending upon which cells they are destroying, it could be skin, it could be liver, it could be kidney. So when you have destruction of those cells, you will lose the function of those cells. Viruses avoid antibody because they spread by cell-to-cell -cell contact. What does it mean? So remember, if the virus goes into the cell, so it's hidden from antibody. So this virus then goes to adjacent cell and would never come to the serum or blood to be exposed to antibody. Because viruses have to go to blood or serum to find an antibody because antibodies are soluble. They are soluble proteins. So this means this virus is protected from antibody, right? because it goes from cell to cell transfer. So that's an important concept. The other important thing for herpes viruses is another scary thing for this particular virus is it has latency. So this goes into your system and sleeps in your neurons. So that's a latency because if you remember your immunology, uh, neurons are protected from the immune response most of the time. Right? Your uh, Myelin sheath, the Schwann cell production may be exposed. You may have multiple sclerosis. But other than that, these go in neurons. So if a virus go in neuron, what do you expect this virus to do? It hides there, but what does it do physiologically? Say it again. Destroy the neurons. So what is actually happening in this case? Depends upon whether they are sensory neurons or motor neurons. If they are sensory neurons being destroyed, you have pain. If you have motor neurons destroyed, you have paralysis. Okay, so keep these two things in your mind. Virus can be reactivated. So when I, whenever I talk for reactivation of virus, keep in mind that this subject of study, we are still investigating, but most of the time, most of the immunologists agree that uh, you can reactivate the virus from a latent stage by stress. And we'll talk about the stress, and we'll also talk about immune suppression today. We talked about cell mediated resolution required, and then again, the symptoms that you normally see in viral infection is from the tissue destruction. Okay, now uh, there are different types of herpes simplex viruses. I'll just concentrate on two important today. So at least you can make a difference as to how benign they are, how malignant they are, type 1 and type 2. And most of your questions that you'll see in the exam are going to judge if you know the difference. Uh, again, doesn't mean that there are not other type of viruses. We may have many different type of viruses, but right now we are, in this class, we are not interested in that, right? We are more interested in something that causes human infections. And that's what I'm going to talk today, HSV1 and HSV2. And then again, uh, remember that both of them cause lytic infection, meaning that they will lyse the cell and be, be released. And I'm going to, I picked up a couple of 
important pictures and a couple of important tables so that you can register in your mind, especially this concept that a benign lesion like a cold sore and the lesion you got on genitalia as highly infectious that we'll call STD. So keep that in mind. And next slides, we're going to talk about that. Herpes simplex 1 versus herpes simplex 2. So let's begin um, from the top. You can see simplex 1 called encephalitis, inflammation of the brain, as compared to 2, which is called meningitis. What does it suggest to you? If I was to ask you, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you which one of them is more invasive. So which one of them is more invasive? One, because it's going to the brain. Meninges are the covering of the brain. Okay. Then again, if you look at their ability to cause sore throat, gingivostomatitis or tonsillitis or labialis, whatever you saw, both of them have capability. So just by looking at the cold sore, you cannot judge whether it is HSV1 or HSV2. Both of them got pharyngitis, but HSV1 goes deeper. It's called esophagitis as well, right? And then again, you can see the invasiveness for type 1 is more, more penetration as compared to, to 1. Now, both of them can cause genital herpes. Both of them can cause genital herpes. Both of, both of them will call vitlo. I'm going to show you some of the pictures if, if you haven't seen what a vitlo looks like. The important difference between STI infection from HSV1 and HS2 is that HSV2 causes perianal herpes. So that's another important thing. And also keep in mind, as I said the other day as well, because of the sexual pre preferences by people, doesn't limit that lesion to one particular area, but it can spread to all the organs being used for, for sexual activity or sexual performance. Now, uh, right now what I've discussed so far that their pathogenesis is familiar because both of them will infect and you must have registered from the previous picture that both of them go for mucoepithelial kind of cells. They can infect, they can hide, they can sleep, but uh, there are some differences that you can see from this table. For example, HSV1 is associated with most of the infection you got above the waist. But again, it doesn't qualify for that true sense, but a little bit of difference clinically as compared to HSV2, which is below the waist, suggesting to you that HSV2 is more involved in STIs, doesn't it? Okay. Now, another similar slide that I just showed to you, maybe will give you a, a different picture from from your book again, uh, HSV1 versus, versus HSV2. But the most important thing again is invasiveness, right? The other difference though, which is not, which was not in the previous slide is that HSV has higher incidence for neonatal HSV. So if the mother ha is having vaginal, vulvar, cervical HSV infection and she gives birth to the baby, the baby will have neonatal HSV. Okay, so that's more prominent in uh, HSV2 as compared to HSV1. The other important thing you will see that the eye infections are more with HSV1 as compared to 2. And HSV infections by viruses are dangerous because you can lose your vision. Number one is very painful. Number two, you can lose your vision. So that's important for HSV infections. The other question I just told you that what triggers that the viruses are there in your system because once you have an infection, they're going to live with you. And uh, what triggers a recurrence? So reactivation of viruses is important that uh, most of us should have a good immune system not to allow our viruses, even if we carry them sleeping in our system, to reactivate. But what causes reactivation? And there's a list of that. It goes on and on. I'm going to spend some time on that. For example, many of people who go for tanning, going to go for sun. So they get exposed to this UV radiation. So that triggers, that is a trigger 
if they were suffering from herpes infection to come and reactivate. Fever itself causes uh, triggering emotional stress. Again, uh, I just copy and paste it. I didn't put final exam because my final exam is usually easy. So, but maybe where people have cumulative, cumulative final exam, that may cause emotional stress to the people. But again, for students, uh, exams are stress. Physical stress, menstruation, some people will get like food spicy, and the most important thing is immunosuppression. As I said, that it could be transient, stress-related. If you are on chemotherapy, or if you are suffering from HIV. So you can see that uh, I would lump it together that whatever stresses you emotionally and whatever stresses your immune system is going to trigger recurrence that you may have with those infections. So how does the picture look like in terms of epidemiology? Uh, as I said earlier, lifelong viruses want to stay with you so they are very faithful. So once you get a virus infection, it stays with you. The only problem you may have it, you keep on getting reactivation recurrence. And then again, the other problem with viruses is that you may not show a disease yourself, but you may be shedding them. As I gave an example yesterday, shedding everywhere. Especially, I gave an example yesterday for the public swimming pools. So that remains one of the dreadful things. Uh, hotels, the linen of hotels, towels, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so the most important other thing is that when we talk of um, especially enveloped viruses, remember that especially for STIs, you have to have, you have to come in contact with those secretions, salivary or sexual secretion, and they have to kind of either touch your skin or mucous membrane for you to acquire it as compared to something which is left alone on a shelf or, you know, different uh, benches, bench top or fomites, uh, especially for the covering one, okay? We think it's an exclusively human disease, but I'm going to talk about some of the incidences and... Uh, I, I did actually this morning was looking and I always do uh, what was the statistics this morning and uh, I'm going to leave it for tomorrow because I'm going to lump it together with another uh, virus that I will discuss tomorrow. But you can see a rising trend. So you can see from here, from 1966, herpes infections are on the rise. So that's the number one message that you normally get from these statistics. And again, uh, you can see that uh, as far as ages are concerned, Teenagers, 14 to 19, so if you are young, you're supposed to have a good immune system, you should take care of these viruses. But if you are in the extreme ages, too young or too old, too young babies because immune system is immature, old age because your system is aging, so you can see uh, a higher incidence. And then again, for some reason, ethnicity, ethnicity as well, you can see that uh, non-Hispanic whites as compared to non-Hispanic blacks, the incidence is high. Now, uh, when I say shedding, so you also have to keep in mind shedding of viruses, especially uh, in secretion. So you can see vesicle fluid. So if you have a skin lesion, it's filled with the vesicle fluid. So anything that touches it is going to spread out. Tears, genital and other secretions are important. And for all practical purposes, so you can see when people have a social contact, it's just like, for example, you know, you have a herpes labialis and you see a little baby, you want to kiss the baby, so you're going to pass it on to the baby. So you have to at least know what's going on you. And then again, especially for sharing of utensil, vertical transmission from mother to baby, mother to fetus in utero. So if mother is having, for example, herpes infection, so that can also pass to uh, people as well. And you can see a very high incidence for HSV-1, 60 to 90%. Now, you'll see a little bit of discrepancy in a couple of the slides, because in the previous slide, I quoted your book saying that HSV-2 was more important. But then again, uh, I'm not going to quiz you much. 
and I myself uh, keep learning every day. But for message for you is that both of them may cause neonatal problems. Okay? And I don't expect you to know all the details. We talked about that once you got especially genital herpes, you will have it for the rest of your life. And uh, we did talk about SSU1 as two majority of the cases that we see, especially in uh, USA, uh, especially, especially for those people who use rectum as one of the outlets for any sexual activity, whether it be a uh, male to male or male to female or whatever, we do see a very high incidence of perianal or perirectal uh, herpetic lesions. And the, uh, the picture is bad in terms of getting more than a million cases every year. So you saw that spiky curve going up, that's where it's coming from. Okay, the other problem with the herpes infection is that it's unrecognized. And uh, most of us, if you were to go, for example, today and wanna check uh, whether you have had HSV infection in the past, so they will look for your antibodies, especially age 12 and above, Quite a high percentage of people will have positive antibody. And HSV2 are not routinely detected. HSV2 zero prevalence increases with the age groups over 40, over 40 and kind of levels off. So that shows basically uh, protective antibodies that you may get in your system. Okay, few more words for transmission. As I already said, that uh, especially in sexual activities, there is a mixing and matching of mucous membrane, and in this case, any mucous membrane that you can imagine can come in contact with the other partner, and then you don't have to have a lesion actually to get infected. You will get infected anyway. And uh, most of the statistics, as I said, uh, we have today is that they think that the initial infection is HSV2. Uh, later in life, then they may get HSV1 as well because of the correlation that people may have in terms of having increased sexual activity, in terms of having more than one partner, and in terms of uh, using many different outlets for gratifying their sexual activity. But uh, nevertheless, the consensus of opinion is that HSV is generally transmitted orally, HSV2 is generally transmitted sexually, but there's a catch over there in this sentence because it doesn't talk about oral sex. Clinical syndromes, the most important thing for herpes infection is pain. So that remains a challenge, especially when it, something that affects your neurons uh, is very painful, especially if it's sensory neuron. And you can see the morbidity and mortality is high, especially for the eye and the brain. And uh, also depends upon what kind of lesion you have. So the lesions will come, normally what happens is that pain comes first and the lesion comes afterwards. So you may see a little bit of irritation in the particular area of the skin, but you don't see anything. So you pain, because I'm gonna explain that to you, where is this pain coming from? But if you were to compare the uh, pathogenesis, this is a clinical course of a typical uh, infection in this case, especially for genital, genital herpes infection. So you can see primary, let's talk about the primary first at the top. So there's a sexual act, sexual contact, and there's a time we call incubation time, and could be anywhere from within a week. And then the very first thing that you will see, and you can see from this graph, and I'm going to ask you, that the local systems appear before the systemic symptoms. So the local symptoms are like typical flu-like symptoms. You feel being unwell. And then the appearance of the lesion like vesicle, which is a wet ulcer, it comes later on. The lymph nodes get tender early. The other important thing from this slide is if I was to ask you and give you this choice, when do you think people will start shedding virus? So you can see basically they will start shedding virus, giving to the other people before the actual appearance of the lesion. So you can see the lesion comes afterwards. 
right? And then again, it may take somewhere like three weeks uh, and then healing begins. But after the healing, keep in mind the virus stays in the system and looking for another opportunity to reactivate. So that kind of an activity is called latent infection. And you can see next time when you have recurrence, so you will have like aura. It's just like nausea. You feel like I'm going to throw up. So that kind of a feeling that you normally get is called prodrome. You know, I'm, I'm going to get sick. I feel lightheaded. So some warning sign will come. We call prodrome. And these symptoms are called prodromal symptoms. Okay, so you can see this time in the primary infection, there was no prodrome. In the secondary infection, you get a prodrome. And then again, you get this time you got lesions and local systems at the same time because your system is already there and you can see again uh, you go through the complete cycle and then there is a healing over there okay so that is a typical thing for the uh, genital herpes so the the whole point over here is that I'm going to show you some pictures of HSV on genital herpes people will take medical attention or people will take um, physicians consult when they see the lesion. Most of the time that brings people to STI clinic when they get that painful ulcer on, on their genitals. But this time they, they are already shedding virus and the ulcer has not appeared even. So they're going to infect their partners before that. Okay, so that's important. Now, this is the pathway. You can see from the left, the virus enters through the skin. So they enter either the skin and the mucous membrane. And then this virus has a tropism attraction from the nerves. So it's going to go and follow the nerve root. It's going to follow the nerve root, go into your spinal cord, and then basically sit there. Most of the time, it's a motor neuron that they sit over there or sensory neuron. So they will find a hiding space and then when your immune system goes down and you're stressed out, it kind of then comes from the hiding, we call it recurrence, and then goes again to the same path and cause lesion on the skin. So the primary entry is from the skin or mucous membrane, goes to the nerves, sits in the spinal cord for, for good, and when you are stressed out or immune system goes down, it comes back again. Now the question is, what will be the route of entry? It could be the skin, it could be uh, skin of the, any part of your body, especially for sexual transmissible diseases, skin and mucous membrane, or it could be oral, or it could be any part of your body. The most severe form of herpes that we normally see, especially is if it's above the waistline, and especially for the babies. That's a very unfortunate part of it. And you can see on the top, presentation is basically gingival stomatitis. It looks like inflammation of the lips of this baby. And what is happening in this case is that she or he had this sore throat over here. You can see from here. So that uh, uh, herpes labialis, a cold sore. And the virus then migrates along the pathway of the trigeminal nerve. So you can see virus basically uh, goes from here and then it sits in the ganglia. So it sits in the ganglia, and when the time comes back, it goes again to cause that kind of an infection there. So that is the most important thing for uh, herpes viruses, that they have attraction for neurons, and they're going to go and sit in your neurons. I'm going to show you some clinical pictures so that you can appreciate what type of lesions can be associated with. Uh, herpetic vitlo on the right hand side is basically a very extreme form of it. I'm going to show you mild form of it and that may ring bell in you and you're going to get a little bit paranoid. You see, I, I, I may have had it in the past because sometimes you see something, as I usually say, mind doesn't know what I, I don't see what mind doesn't know. So you really have to appreciate these kind of picture and that's a part of our learning as well, visual memory. And you can see from here. This one again is skin infection. A, we call herpes gladiatorum, and uh, the physicians are at risk, People, children are at risk. I should add pharmacists over there as well, but maybe you guys are protected, drive through, so everything is covered, so you don't have to worry and see the patient, even pick up prescription. 
But uh, people who have especially uh, herpetic vitro on the fingers, very common. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the incidence is, but uh, I've hardly seen a physician who doesn't have a herpetic vitro. She didn't get scared though. But uh, these are the routes of entry of these particular herpes viruses. So the next question will come, what do we do? Well, we have this antiviral therapy. Again, same rule as I told you the other day, stopping attachment and so on and so forth. Objective of the treatment is you cannot take the virus away from the system. You cannot. But you, what you need to do is prevent or shorten the course of primary or current disease or alleviate pain. That's the purpose of antiviral therapy. So what do we have? We have antiviral drugs. Unfortunately, no vaccine is available for herpes. Healthcare workers should wear gloves to prevent herpetic vitlo, but I just told you that many times they do not. Because especially if you're working as a physician, I myself, if you want to examine a patient, if she has a fever or tenderness, nobody is going to examine with the gloves on. So they really need to have that palpation, that feeling there to touch feeling for the fever, palpation, nod nodularity, granularity. So they pretty much end up picking up whatever they have. Okay. So I'm going to go and I'm pretty sure that you can also look at the CDC website. I posted some of the pictures on your STI workshop as well. So you may see a little bit of redundancy there, but I'm going to give you some uh, key concepts that you want to remember. CDC copyrighted thing. Uh, you can see uh, mothers giving birth, ST, mothers having STI, herpes infection, giving birth to the babies, and the babies will have that kind of a picture when they pick up herpes. Vitlo in a very advanced stage, again, a problem. Uh, cold sore, again, have infection under the tongue. And next slide is what I'm going to show, and then you can, I'm going to leave it on you, and you can figure out and find out if you ever have that. This is called herpetic vitro. This is like a little bit elevated white thing. It comes on the fingers sometimes, especially when you are depressed or stressed out. And then it's very painful. And it comes and goes, unless it gets infected on the other side. Herpetic vitlo, very common, very common. As I said, uh, I just told you, I haven't seen any physician who doesn't have it because it's right there. There's nothing you can do. But this shows that you have had herpes infection. And again, uh, for the right hand side, it's infected. The other thing I said for STI infection is that any lump or bump, any discharge, any ulcer, on male and female genitalia is a very serious concern. You cannot ignore that, and people do not ignore it because that's going to be the beginning of the problem, especially for the herpes as well. You can see typical herpes infection on the shaft of penis. And if you don't treat it, and it comes to advanced stage, you can see a blistering appearing, and uh, again, very painful condition that will bring people in STI clinic, especially for, um, uh, for infections. Again, from CDC site, and some of them are vesicles. Vesicles are filled with these viruses. They look close, but they can erupt and then pass it on to the partners. Again, an ulcer. Ulcer in any part of any male and female genitalia, I said, has to be taken very seriously because this is a sure, uh, like a hallmark, I would say, of STIs in this on male and over there on a the female uh, in clitoris. Uh, some of them, the deeper ulcers you can see from here, especially in vestibule. If you were to do uh, vaginal uh, speculum examination and look at their services, you will see typical cervicitis as well. It can also appear on buttock, different forms. It's very difficult for us to appreciate that. And then again, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it can also appear on the oral cavity. And the whole idea for STI especially is that whatever part of the body comes with your partner, you're going to pick it up and then you will have uh, that particular lesion that you classically we used to think that maybe it's like on the genitalia, but since people uh, uh, are using different modes of uh, sexual activity, you may see in oral cavity, you may see uh, in pharynx, you may see in rectum, you can see in many different places. The next associated bacteria is varicella zoster virus. VZV, and again, pretty much the same. So if you know these series of events that you normally see, you'll see quite a few similarity. 
And again, uh, this particular is more like in the respiratory tract. So you see, you acquire it through inhalation. So that actually goes to your respiratory tract. It goes into your epithelial cell, and your immune cell T cells will come and fight with it. Same problem, the way it causes infection, goes to infect the cell, and infect one cell, recruit other cell, like may form a club or a group, we call it syncytia. It's called cytopathology. Syncytia. Syncytia means a network. So it kind of recruits more cell, more problem, and then you can see it spreads from cell to cell. As I said yesterday, there, since respiratory tract is rich with blood supply, the chances are this virus will go into your blood and you may have viremia, virus running in your blood. So if your virus runs in the blood, it can take it to anywhere the blood takes it to. But again, the most likely places where it gets filtered in the kidney, it gets filtered in liver, it gets filtered in spleen, and then again, it can cause blood brain barrier and cause problems there. Same problem, virus has the ability to hide. The other problem with this particular virus is that it goes to the dorsal root and cranial nerve brain ganglia. So that's where, you know, because we have this higher cranial nerves, very sensitive hearing, seeing, all these things that can go over there. Viruses wants to uh, replicate over there. The other important thing for this virus, you must have heard about shingles. I'm going to talk a little bit of that. Because that's again a varicella zoster virus. So that's what normally is. You may get fever or you may not get a fever. You have to have a very strong cell mediated immunity to fight that off. Uh, many a times, especially in children, people having cancers, they don't present with a cancer, but they present with this skin infection. And you want to make sure that you investigate at least do their blood profile and look if their blood profiles are okay because it's cell mediated immunity. They have normal cell counts, they have normal T cell, B cell, neutrophils, and so on and so forth. Recurrence, again, remains a problem, and uh, I'm gonna talk about, uh, there are very nice pictures in your book, I believe, the mechanisms of disease, you can see, you can acquire from the air droplet, it goes to the respiratory tract, lymphatics pick it up, it goes to the reticular endothelial system, that includes liver, spleen, and T cell, and you have this primary viremia, so viremia is where you feel fever, malaise, and then again, it can appear either on the skin or it can appear on the mucous membrane. It can get healed, but it will stay in your system as latent in neurons. So I'm gonna ask you, for example, which of one of the following have this capability to be latent in neurons? I talk about herpes, I talk about varicella zoster virus. Okay, now again, if you were to look at the uh, viral replication, so you can see the whole time point. The other important thing that you keep in mind is, you wanna know is that, is this virus contagious? If yes, for how long and when? So in this case, you can see from here that you have a primary vire viremia and you have a secondary viremia. The question I'm gonna ask you is that, you only become contagious when you go for the secondary viremia. That's where you basically see the skin. So the moment you see skin disease, the moment you see ulcers, the moment you see a vesicular rash, that's where you now you become contagious. And before that, I mean two days the information is that uh, you do not, but you do, may have got, and this is a classical example for chicken pox. That's what, uh, before we started the vaccination for chickenpox, uh, mothers, you can ask your grandmother, she would tell you, tell you that, uh, women used to talk that all of my children have had chickenpox. The idea was that they will have chickenpox once in a lifetime and will be lifelong immunity, correct. That is true, okay? But some problems I'm gonna talk about uh, today. Uh, Epidemiology, as I said, just said, virus causes lifelong infection or lifelong immunity. Recurrent disease come, transmission again, could be respiratory viruses. The question is who is at risk? So the age group is five to nine. So we wanna, we, these days we don't wait for the kids to have a natural infection of chicken pox. We give them vaccine. Okay, so that's the key over here. We give them vaccine. 
Now, I want you to understand uh, some of the similarities that you may have in terms of the differences from chicken pox and shingles, for example. So the, the idea is that uh, everyone who have had either chicken pox or who have had chicken pox vaccine, vaccination should have a lifelong immunity. But the virus has this capability to reactivate if you go through that stress, if you go through this immunocompromised situation. So viral will come back. This comeback virus comes back in the form of shingles. So that's, what, that's why normally we see shingles in patients more than 50 and 60 because your immune system is dying out. So if you were to go and check your status for VZV, you will have more than 90% of us will have an antibody from VZV. And if you, for example, cannot recall, I mean, that's another word of advice. You ask your mom or ask your parents, was I being vaccinated for that? They say no, so you wanna go back and get it vaccinated even now, so that works. So uh, <clears throat> the problem is that if it's respiratory, it may cause pneumonia, it goes into the brain, it causes encephalitis. We normally, uh, in this country, we only get uh, problems, especially in elderly or people who are uh, immunocompromised with herpes zoster. So herpes zoster is the one that gives you shingles. And uh, also keep in mind, um, I'm gonna let you read that and I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures for you to appreciate. Uh, it's more of a dermatome. So what happens is that it's going to appear either on T3 and L3. T3, L3 are the typical sites. If you see anything in the level of your umbilicus on the right hand side, especially for L3 level, that's a sign for shingles. Or at the back at T3 level, typical shingles. And it follows the course of the dermatome of the sensory neuron. And this is how the pictures look like. You can see the whole dermatome. Very classical pictures over here, classical picture. Uh, on this one, just follows the dermatome of the skin, if you remember the dermatomes. Uh, if you're going to ask me, I do see um, Walgreen and CVS touting the shingles vaccine, but uh, I'll just give you a little bit of perspective because I did study that. So FDA approved in May 2006 the vaccine called Zostavax for people over 60. The only addition they did was in 2011 when they add another 10 years to that, so 50 to 59. Most of these people uh, may get healed within a week or month. The, most of the data presents, if it doesn't heal in one month, um, is called post herpetic neuralgia, and that may take three months, but it's basically a, a painful situation when these patients go through and uh, the challenge is again to give them narcotics and uh, help them ease out pain or go for the nerve block. Uh, the last few slides, uh, again, um, I'm going to go through the chicken pox. We already talked about that. You should not give them uh, aspirin because of Rye syndrome. You pretty much know that. Uh, extreme forms of chicken pox, CDC can see, it's called varicella. Some of the pictures for the ch chicken pox, you should not get it. Uh, chicken pox, chicken pox, small pox. One last slide. It's eradicated from the world. Good news. Same problem, same virus that's causing the chicken pox. Small pox have been eradicated, but I do see, I mean, you would still see some senior citizens who have had small pox and they survived. Right? And uh, these pictures are only for academic interest. You would never see them, but you can see the, the situation of this virus that if it was to involve your whole skin, smallpox virus. If you want to see the difference between the chickenpox, chickenpox is more central to your tummy as compared to smallpox, which is peripheral. And if you want to know the dermatome, these are the dermatomes that we normally see. And I just told you, especially for the shingles, it's usually L3. So you can see L3 there or T3, especially on the right hand side. So these are the classical things and I'm gonna let you read next of the slides, same picture, that how the skin surface goes in terms of the progression of that virus. The virus hides itself in neuron, especially dorsal root ganglion, 
and then it may come over and over again as we talk. So these are some of the sites. And uh, I would uh, request you to uh, read on your own. I'm not going to ask you much regarding uh, the clinical picture for this particular uh, case.